Well, welcome everybody. My name is Sandra Vidrio and it's a pleasure to connect with each one of you today. Welcome uh, Sandra, to- Sandra, um, just one second. I didn't hear the recording thing. Is it, is it recording now? It, it is recording, yes. Okay, good, okay. There you Facebook go. Facebook Live and it's also recording. Okay, good. Perfect, so we will go ahead and it looks like all of our participants are joining. Perfect. So yes, yeah, so, so our topic for today is uh, we're going to, uh, we have Bill Cal joining us, who will be providing a general overview of legal uh, it, it, items, in, in other words, a checklist that business owners should keep in mind as they begin to reopen their business location, or perhaps they have been open, but things to to keep in mind. And with that, I want to really quickly remind you to please um, use the chat box to send in your questions. That way we can address them during the Q&A. So if you're using a computer, you should be able to see the chat box feature on your screen at the lower uh, right corner. And if you're using a tablet or a, a cell phone to connect, you just simply go to more and select the chat feature. And also we have Spanish interpretation being provided on behalf of the team at Linguistica. So Emilia, I know you are connected here. So we want to just briefly share the instructions on how to connect. Sí, muy buenas tardes a todos. Esta junta está siendo interpretada en lenguaje de español. Para poder acceder a la interpretación, usted seleccionará el icono del mundo que aparece abajo de su pantalla, seleccionará el lenguaje español y modo silencio el audio original o mute original audio en inglés. Si usted está por tableta o por teléfono, entonces es un poquito diferente. Seleccionará los tres puntitos que significan más o en inglés more y luego seleccionará interpretación y el lenguaje de español y modo silencio el audio original. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Emilia. Gracias. And I want to take this time to say thank you to the following companies for their support in allowing us to bring these weekly webinars to our small business community and also for their support and, and commitment to our organization. So thank you to Bank of America, Comcast, Bank of the West, Chevron, FHL Bank of San Francisco, Donna G. Sales, JP Morgan Chase and Company, Tri Counties Bank, Union Bank, and Wells Fargo. Thank you for your support. And this is the agenda for today. So today we actually, um, I'll just quickly share some updates here with the foundation. And we're also joined by Ileana Perez, who is the Director of Research and Entrepreneurship at Immigrants Rising, which is an organization that has presence in the, the throughout California, including here in the Central Valley. And they will be sharing with us an exciting program and also additional resources available for our small business community and entrepreneurs. And we will also be joined by Bill Cow, who is the director at the New Business Committee Law Clinic, a legal clinic at Berkeley Law. And so we're thankful for having the partnership with Immigrants Rising and NBCLC. And of course, we will end the session with the Q&A. And really quickly, the foundation, as many of you may know, we are an organization here in the Central Valley with the mission of helping startup businesses, existing businesses, connecting them with resources to better uh, provide success in, in their business journey. And we have, we are still having our virtual TA. So if you are looking to know about the permits, licenses, the regulations, compliance, up-to-date information, grant opportunities, give us a phone call here at the foundation and we'll be more than glad to assist you through our virtual technical assistance program. And of course, our weekly webinars are still continuing and they will continue throughout 2021. So if there's a topic of interest, you know, use the chat box right now or post it on Facebook Live, you know, topics that you want to hear in the near future in our next meeting here with um, the next legal webinar will be on April, the third Friday of April. So let us know in the comment what, what topic you would like to learn more about. And also this year, we are excited to share with the world that we, that the foundation is now a certified community development financial institution. And we are, our microloan operation program is growing and expanding. So if you're a business looking to get back into um, your, your expanding your operations, pivoting your business operations, and you're needing a loan to purchase a new equipment or, or access to capital, give us a phone call and we'll be glad to provide you with some of the resources that we may be able to help you with. And as a reminder, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and you can also visit our YouTube page to catch a recording of our of previous webinars. So with that, I want to take the opportunity to welcome Ileana to provide us with some information and resources on the organization Immigrants Rising. 
Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you to all of you who are joining us today. So excited to be part of this partnership. Um, and I just wanna take a, a brief moment to introduce our organization and um, the concept of our Undocu Hustle. Um, next slide, please. And so um, Immigrants Rising is an organization based out of the Bay Area, but we definitely have reach across the state and nationwide. And so I just wanted to point you all to some of the resources that we have available to the community, regardless of immigration status. Um, we have a wide variety of resources that we have been compiling for a very long time now to specifically inform the immigrant community about ways to earn an income regardless of immigration status. In addition to that, uh, we also have funding available to undocumented social entrepreneurs, although we are currently in the middle of reopening that application. So definitely stay tuned as to when we'll, uh, we will reopen those small grants to individuals. We also partner with the small business majority um, to um, uh, provide support for individuals utilizing their Venturize platform, which allows individuals to find local support to help you at any stage of your entrepreneurial journey. And we also have one-on-one um, -on -one consultations available for anybody who is looking to learn a little bit more about entrepreneurship, who wants you know, to speak to somebody about your business. If you have any questions related to business, we do have our entrepreneurship hotline, which you can access on our website at immigrantsrising.org under Making Money. Next slide, please. We also are super excited to announce um, our Undocu Hustle um, Entrepreneurship Learning Hub. This is an online uh, learning hub intended to be for anybody who is interested in learning more about uh, what it means to become um, an entrepreneur as an immigrant. Uh, our uh, Undocu Hustle Learning Hub is available in English and Spanish. It's available to anyone on a mobile, on tablet, on a computer. So this is a really great opportunity for those of you that are intrigued, want to know a little bit more about what entrepreneurship looks like um, at your own pace, at your own time. And so with that, I will pass it along. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ileana, for, for, the, for the opportunity to join us virtually and, of course, share with our community here in the Central Valley the great resources that Immigrant Rising is, is, has available. And I would now like to, oops, let's do stop share here. Uh, so we're going to welcome Bill, who will be, he was going to be our co-host um, to share with us some information. My, my walk on music or something? Becoming an entrepreneur <laughs> oh, yes, I think was a me. conscious decision once I saw my bank account. There you go. I think the, it linked to the, to the, um, to the YouTube video. Yep. We're back on, <laughs> back to no technical difficulties. <laughs> so you can oh, to share your screen here. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, nice to see you today. Hope you're uh, all healthy, family members, um, loved ones healthy and doing okay, heading into a fun weekend. Um, and by the way, I got to put in a plug for Undocu Hustle there. I spent some time on the on the website there and the, and the different videos and the advice about different, you know, aspects of entrepreneurship. It's just so, um, it is so engaging and inspiring. So, so um, Ileana, thank you so much for putting that together. I highly recommend it to anybody thinking of starting a business there. So uh, let me see, let's uh, start sharing my screen and uh, we can get into the checklist uh, that we put together uh, for today. So let's get this up here, get the slideshow going. And what I'd like to do here is um, try and blaze through this as I can in about 25 minutes, I think it'll take, and then have certainly lots of time for questions. So I won't be taking questions in the middle, uh, but do put them in the chat because that's where I'll go right to the chat uh, to, to get started afterward. Um, so let's see, um, Sandra, you'll be, um, you'll be letting people in as, as people go, right? Or, or I should let them in, I guess, I guess if I see them, I'll bring them in too. Okay. All right, folks. Well, as I said, legal checklist for getting back to business. Um, no, not to be cynical or anything like this, but you know what, when I started putting this together, I happened to notice <laughs> that we did some, uh, a workshop like this, um, back in May of 2020, and I guess it's not really funny, but it had a similar title, sort of going, you know, what you need to know when you're reopening back in May 2020. So I think we're actually in a different place now. I think this is actually stuff that you could use. And, you know, that over-optimism at that point, I guess, was uh, forgivable. But um, so, so when I start putting the thoughts together here for this, what I, I refer to as a legal checklist for getting up and going open, 
I said to myself, well, you know, there's so much you folks have to worry about. Uh, you know, don't want to give you anything lengthy or anything like that. So I actually came up with um, three things that would be good for you to pay attention to here. Okay. So a very short list, but a very important list <laughs> going here and here. Anybody who's starting a business, or excuse me, starting to get back to business at this point or starting a business, I think uh, what I boiled this down to is sort of what's new, what is different about getting started back into business at this point. Um, and of course, the first one is probably the first two are kind of related and something that everybody is on, is on everybody's mind, but I'm going to try and give you some concrete steps about what to do with, with this. First, of course, you know, being more uh, cognizant of health and safety uh, regulations, things, guidelines to help keep, keep people safe. And at the same time, while you're doing that, you are managing your lawsuit risks uh, from um, COVID-related loss lawsuits. I'll tell you a little bit of what's going on there. And then finally, there has been some very important changes around contractors, whether you are a contractor or whether you use contractors. Yeah, there's some, it's, it's now a little touchier using contractors. Um, and so we'll help you on the contracting side if you're doing it, how you get back in that game. Uh, also, if you're using contractors, some things to, to watch out for. All right, and I will say, of course, this is all general legal information, you know, Nothing like uh, specific legal advice for for anybody, but do con uh, do consult individually with an attorney uh, if uh, you have a particular issue. You can sign up for office hours with us uh, through our website, which um, I'll have information at the end there. Uh, but anytime, you know, just check with Sandra or, or folks; they can put you in, in touch with us. Uh, it's um, I don't here. I'll say www.law.berkeley.edu dash uh, it's gonna be backslash nbclc. And that will get you to our website where you can sign up for these weekly office hours, Monday, Wednesday, 11 to 2 p.m. And then, of course, for first Friday and third Friday, too. All right. Well, let's get going. Let's think about upping your health and safety game going forward. OK, well, uh, first thing you got to think about is, well, where is your county on the reopening side of things? And I'm sad to say that um, I don't think it's changed as of the last 24 hours, but um, Fresno uh, at this point and much of the Valley is still in what's called the purple tier. Uh, Sandra, I don't know if you heard anything in the next 20, last 24 hours, but you know, the, the positivity rate is relatively far down. It used to be quite, quite high, uh, but now uh, I'm thinking it's in the threes or maybe the fours. Uh, that's, that's, you know, looking good, but still in a situation where um, the county is limited in terms of what businesses can do in terms of opening. I'll tell you a little bit more what that means in, in a minute. Um, but as you can see, there are larger portions of the state that are in the red tier, which is the next level. Then that's the next level that where Fresno and the Valley will, will get to uh, soon. So what does purple tier mean? Well, this is sort of the overview slide of what it means. You know, I suppose with the purple tier, you're thinking in terms of large spaces where people are doing business at 25% capacity, like retail or malls or stuff like that. Uh, whereas other things that are more close contact, like hair salons or restaurants, you know, getting in, you know, close in contact with the waiters and waitresses and stuff, uh, or gyms, you know, where people are close by working out and stuff, you know, most of this now is only outdoor only. Um, and of course, businesses are scrambling to try and create little, you know, sort of outdoor spaces where they can do their service and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's a tough situation because uh, being outdoors, you know, how many places have any additional space that they weren't using already? Uh, and they're trying to do, you know, find a way to do business out there. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what uh, Fresno is doing, but there's something we're doing up here in Berkeley uh, called, uh, we, we refer to them as parklets parklets and uh, you know it takes a little time to do this but what's happening is businesses are purchasing the the, the street parking spaces outside of their um, outside of their businesses like restaurants and stuff and then closing them off so that then um, you know essentially they're putting their uh, you know tables and chairs and stuff in the street and then putting some kind of uh, barrier around it like that and of course, if you have to pay for that, you'd have to pay the city for you know the parking fees that would normally come from those spaces. But it has allowed a number of restaurants to, 
you know, indoor restaurants to get going again. So um, now here's the next thing you can take a look, you know, look forward to is the red tier. Okay, here you go. Like hair salons can open indoors with some modifications, you know, greater um, health and safety and, uh, you know, wiping things down and maybe some ventilation type stuff. Um, you know, a number of businesses can open indoors with modifications at this point. Uh, restaurants, you know, can open indoors at 25% uh, capacity. Um, so, so again, there's still some places like theme parks that have to um, stay closed, professional sports, so you can't have live audiences there. Um, but this is where purple is going to go to red soon, we hope, for, for your counties there. Um, and then I guess what I'd say, one other thing to think about is there are specific business, you know, like cosmo cosmetologists or, um, you know, landscapers or other things like this that go from the, this uh, industry guidance website here on, on um, COVID19.ca.gov. So uh, what I'm going to give you is just take a look at these um, individual business types here. And by the way, limited service providers over here on the right, um, those are where you have lots of people sort of doing, you know, like plumbers and coming to your house doing stuff and landscapers are in there. And so if you go to this site, click on the name of the business, the type of business that's closest to you, there'll be specific industry guidance about what you need to do um, to be ready to reopen or, you know, what you need to do when you're reopened, okay? Um, and there may be a couple here that I suppose some things could be, I don't know, um, analogized. So from what am I thinking of? Uh, things like, well, delivery services. Maybe delivery service is one thing, but maybe there's a kind of business that also uses delivery services. So you might want to check both of those sites there to make sure you just got everything. Okay, and here's another one. Okay, I think there's one more after this. Yeah, the variety of stuff here. I guess the good thing that you should just know about is that the guidance that they added here on the state website was very much formulated by people in the industry, by engineers, by public health people. So it's not just, you know, sort of our best guess of what you have to do. These are some really good guidelines going forward. All right. And I think we got one more. Do I have one more? Nope, nope, that's the last one. So as I said, go to this website here, you get some very specific guidelines for opening your particular kind of business there. Now the counties are doing things a little differently here. I thought this was an interesting thing that Merced is doing, okay? Uh, so what they're doing is they say in Merced County, okay, well, businesses, we wanna know that you're committed to these things that, you know, you, all these changes you're gonna have to make, these health and safety moves and stuff. We want you to self-assess and certify that you're going to do all these things. Okay, you post some signage about restrictions for your customers at the entrance, just to sort of set the rules of the game so that people aren't going to follow the rules, then they don't come in. I mean, ideally, they hope that they don't come in. Um, that your employees have had some safety training, that you regularly monitor the health of your employees, you enforce social distancing, lots of sanitization, so then once you make this self-certification, you actually get this downloadable page to print out and place in the entry of your business. It, it almost, I think it's a marketing thing really, uh, that where the city of Merced is saying, we're gonna sort of team with you to say, you know, if you show this kind of assertion of the things you're supposed to do, we're going to sort of let you, I don't know, almost sort of build upon the name of the county of Merced that, that you've been, you know, self-checked out and you're going to be doing these kinds of things. You know, if your county isn't doing this, I would say it might be a good idea to do it anyway. Um, you know, I don't mean go to Merced County and do it. I'm just saying maybe do this sort of stuff and then post a sign in your, in, you know, at the front of your business saying, we've done all of these different things. Um, you know, it's a little too early to tell that marketing goes several different ways. Of course, there's some, you know, anti-vax and anti-mask people out there. And then there's also a lot of people out there who are really scared about going back to business, you know, going back to the way things were without seeing, you know, before going in the door, what the business's commitment to these changes have been. So I think this might be a good idea, but what I'm saying is, 
the, uh, the, the best part of this idea is that anybody can do this and everybody should do it. If you have pub the public coming into your business, yeah, let them know sort of how careful you're gonna be and what the rules are coming in there for sure. Good idea, marketing kind of thing. Uh, oh, and this is that sticker. Yeah, I guess there's a sticker that you put this thing in your um, business uh, window if you're in your staff. Okay, so here's the, by the way, you could check it out at this um, link there, right there. Okay, well, now, um, so that's sort of the external consumer focus on the health on the health stuff. Now you got to think about, okay, what do I need to do internally if I have uh, employees? Okay. And so here's the most important thing. And that is that you have a plan for what you're going to do. Okay. Just write it down. And there's, there's a couple of examples of this plan. Here's a good one um, at uh, dir.ca.gov. Um, it's a sort of a fill in the blank kind of plan for stuff. And I'll show you sort of what the components of that are in just a second here, but it's essentially showing, look, we're gonna take this seriously. We have some, some steps we're gonna take and we're gonna write them down. And then we're also gonna train our employees in all of these uh, different provisions that we're gonna do. And here's the absolute most important thing. Uh, if you don't get anything else from this workshop, take this away. And that is take a moment to make a record of any compliance effort, any health and safety efforts that you're doing, write it down, <laughs> write it down and put it in a file somewhere or something um, or put it up on the wall or you know, some kind of taking credit for what you're doing going forward here. And I'll tell you in a moment that how connected and how important that is to your sort of lawsuit prevention plan um, because there's gonna be so much, many people out there, um, you know, just trying to do the right thing who maybe don't take the extra step to keep track of it. And the ones who are doing that are going to be so much safer, so much, um, you know, create so much protection for themselves going forward. Okay. So what does this plan need to look like? Well, I would say to you that this plan, from what I read about uh, what the plan is supposed to do, it's actually supposed to be a plan you would normally do anyway in your business. There's this infectious, I think it's called the infectious disease and something like risk prevention uh, plan or something like this that employers actually have to do under the um, Employment Development Department. So this is just a sort of a special version of it for the COVID risks going on here. And so what you want to do in your IDPR plan here is, you know, first think about the risk for your workers. Okay, well, if you're if you basically don't have any customers coming in and you're an online business, well, gee, this is more straightforward. You're just talking about risk exposures from workers vis-a-vis -vis -vis workers, <laughs> okay? But if you have members of the public coming in um, and there's a distinction here, yeah, maybe you have, let me think for a second, uh, you're in a mall, okay? Uh, people just walking by your space in the mall those are members of the public, but people actually coming into your space, that's the customers, of course. And then you got coworkers, some of these members of the public or customers or coworkers are gonna be actually sick and they you know, haven't taken the steps to isolate at home. So you gotta think about, yeah, um, what do we do with people in our space that might present risk to, uh, to everyone in the space? And then of course you have to think about, well, your workers are gonna go home at some point if they're working out of the home, if they're coming into work for you. Yeah, what's the exposure there? And we'll talk in a moment about what kind of, how would I say, control you can have over that because of course you can't say to workers, you know, don't be with your family or don't see friends or stuff like that. But you should take into account what they're doing. So I think it is okay to ask them things like, you know, do you have any family members sick at home? Um, uh, let's see, do you live in a, in a place in you know, close proximity to a lot of people? These may seem like intrusive questions, but I guess what I would say is, as long as you explain to them, the reason we're doing this is we're trying to take a, into account the risk factors for each person and then do things you know, accordingly. Um, and then of course, each worker's individual risk factors, you know, I'm borderline diabetic. So, you know, if I was back at UC, we're all doing everything online right now. But if I was back at UC, they should be paying attention to the fact that I'm going to be a little bit more at risk than, 
than others. Um, actually, I just got vaccinated, so I'm, I'm at less risk than that thing. Uh, but um, yeah, you take these things into account for sure. Um, then in your plan, you know, you think of some different contingencies. I, I mean, I'm sad to say that I've seen in the papers, it seems like we may be heading for another surge in, in, um, in California. Uh, so, you know, take into account that there may be some more people going out on sick leave. Uh, there may be some other businesses that you rely on that are giving you stuff, you know, ingredients for your food business or something like that, that may be interrupted during, during this period of time. Have some plans for that. And then, of course, explore ways to work in the social distancing among people, maybe stagger the work shifts so there aren't so many people around at the same time. Um, maybe do some remote service delivery at, you know, leaving things at people's door instead of actually, you know, getting in contact with them or having people in the store. Things like that. <clears throat> and then look out for ways that you can operate with a smaller staff maybe training people so they could do different jobs if one person goes out. You see. And now one other thing that your plan has to have under new state law is got to have some plan for what to do with COVID related violence. People coming into your store, getting violent about your asking them to wear a mask. Um, we just saw it in the paper today. Oh my God, somebody in, I can't remember where it was, but um, there was a jack in the box and a guy came in without a mask and they said, look, you can't be in here without a mask. Um, and he looked like he was leaving. And then the manager turned around and the guy just pulled out a knife and started stabbing him in the back. Uh, and then he fled. So, you know, some people feel really strongly about these things. And so you got to have a plan uh, for what to do with it. I'm sad to say, yeah. Okay, um, so basic infection prevention measures. As I said, you look at the industry specific guidelines you're getting from the state, of course, but these are some more sort of general ones that everybody pretty much needs to do. And of course you got masks, social distancing, hand washing, training about your plan encouraging workers to self-monitor, encouraging them to stay home if they're sick, um, you know, those sorts of things, um, providing lots of tissues and trash cans and maybe some of those, you know, easy to grab 70% uh, alcohol wipes that then anybody can just grab one, wipe their hands down, throw it in a trash can. Maybe one of these, you know, dispenser Purell things that they just stick their finger under and then they get some in their hand without touching it. Certainly the janitors have to be more you know, up on things going forward. And then some plan, have some plan for isolation. If somebody is sick at your workplace, either a customer or a worker, what do you do until somebody can come and get there and pick them up? You know? All right. Uh, generally the sense would be if a worker has a sick family member at home and they can't isolate from them, then probably a good idea to have them work at home. You know, why bring that into your, into your workspace uh, there? Um, and then, you know, some don'ts would be, you know, in the space, if you got tools that people are using, make sure they're wiped down in between each person using them, um, have some more space between people. Um, don't really, you can require a doctor's note, but don't make the person go to a doctor to get the note. I mean, that just exposes them some more going to the doctor's office there. Uh, generally, you know, might be a good idea to take the person's word at their, at, at, about being sick at this point. Um, and I know, I know a number of uh, cynical folks in Congress would say, well, but they're just being encouraged to stay home and, and laze around. Well, you know, this is what the Cal OSHA would say is in, when you inform your workers about the safety measures you're taking, if they feel safe at work, <laughs> If they feel like you're taking reasonable efforts to protect them, they are much less likely to be unnecessarily absent. All right, let's see, just a couple other things uh, you should know. This is, this is where you probably wanna get more industry specific guidance here. The OSHA, Cal OSHA website is very good for this, but they identify sort of four things that people, that businesses generally do. Uh, and now in order of effectiveness. So for example, if you start putting up barriers like a plexiglass in front of your cash register or something like that, yeah, that's gonna be, that's gonna be 
very effective <laughs> to keep from customers, you know, with the droplets getting on your cashier. Um, filters, uh, improve your ventilation, these sorts of things. They cost some money, but they are very effective when you put these things in. But, you know, maybe you don't need to do so much of that. Maybe the risk of people coming in contact with you isn't that high that you have to do with that. Nobody's coming in. Yeah, maybe it's just administrative controls make some more sense here. You know, these staggered work shifts, so there are fewer people in the workspace uh, at, the, at the time. Um, certainly doing the training, um, doing more meetings over video. These are some administrative controls that really don't cost very much, but um, that can be very effective too. And then of course, these safe work practices, we we're talking about having lots of places to wash hands and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then of course, providing the PPE, uh, if, you need, if needed to keep the workers safe, you need to provide them, yeah. Okay, well, the last thing uh, I was just gonna mention are these new things about reporting that you have to do, okay? This is from Cal OSHA here. So in November, California approved this new standard on sort of prevention and here's what you gotta do, okay? Um, if workers um, uh, have had or are going to have potential COVID exposure in the workplace, you, sh you need to do some testing. You need to maybe get one of those little guns that you point them at their head and you see if they've got, you know, uh, a fever or something, something like this. You have to provide this to them at no cost. Um, and then of course, if somebody does turn out to have COVID or some symptoms, then you need to tell them what they have in terms of sick time or, you know, the ability to take some time off or stuff. The local health department actually has to be notified. Uh, if you have three cases in the workplace, um, uh, I think it's over, a, I'm sorry, it's supposed to be a three place, three cases, I believe it's, I have ever checked this out, I think it's within a week, or maybe it's 10 days, uh, or 20 cases within a 30 day period, you actually have to inform them and then take guidance from them on how to prevent future, you know, for, further spread there. Um, you have to keep track of all COVID-19 cases, but at the same time, you know, don't put them up on the board, you know, you, you, you do actually, it's, it's kind of a funny situation here right now because yeah, if um, I was at my workplace um, and somebody got sick in the same, you know, office area that I was, the employer has to inform me of who got sick because then I can weigh my risk as to how much contact I had with, with them there. But at the same time, you don't wanna be putting up like a list of people who got COVID here, like, you know, it's the employee of the month club or something. Um, instead, um, you know, you keep these records because, you know, maybe the health department needs to come in and see them, um, you know, again, take out maybe the personal identifying information if uh, other people, um, unauthorized people are gonna see it. And then here you go, of course, any serious illness or death has to be reported as well to the Cal OSHA district office going forward. So these are new requirements as of November. Again, hopefully you're not gonna have many cases in your workplace and certainly hopefully no, no serious injuries, illness or death or something. So this is where you find the source for, for that, a little more information what you need to do. Okay, well, there's this last part you should know that yeah, you may have employees working from home. Well, you do actually have some guidelines that you have to pay attention to from there. All right, so first thing is uh, there's this workplace policies poster that you're, you can get online that talks about the different um, federal and state benefits that they have related to sick leave and things like that, uh, OSHA policies and stuff. Uh, you get one of these posters. By the way, um, there's certainly a number of businesses out there that are trying to sell you this as, at a premium. My understanding is that you can go online and get this poster for certainly less than 50 bucks somewhere. Okay, but sorry, some businesses trying to charge you hundreds of dollars for these things. No, no. Um, so here's a few other things. Normally, um, if you're an employer, you would have to have uh, an employee come in, who a new employee come in and verify their I-9 right to work information, uh, proof of right to work in the US in person. But now you can do that through email or video during the pandemic, that's a new change. Um, and here's a few things. Look, if you were gonna reimburse uh, uh, 
employee at your work office for like a computer or furniture or other things like that, the law is that you have to reimburse them for doing that for those equipment if they don't have it at home too. Yeah, uh, they need an ergonomic keyboard. Yeah, you need to get that for them if they're gonna be working at home. Now, as we're all in Zoom these days and stuff, uh, you do have to take some steps to make sure that those Zoom working environments, you know, meetings and stuff, you know, people aren't coming in and cracking, you know, the sexy jokes that are making, you know, everybody feel uncomfortable or, you know, like Jeffrey Tubin dropped his pants in the middle of a work meeting. I mean, these are things that you still have to police because, you know, there's still interaction on Zoom that could raise, you know, harassment claims. So, and then one final thing is, um, this doesn't go very far, but I, what I would say is this part about requiring workers to change work environments at home. Yeah, you can't tell them, I don't know, um, you have to work outside or something, something like this. But you can, if you find out, see, I would do this because unfortunately I had a tragedy in my past about this, but uh, somebody, um, you're, you're an employer, your employee is always doing a Zoom meeting from their garage, okay? Uh, maybe in that situation you wanna say, I, I, are you leaving the door open? I mean, you're not running a car or something while you're in there, right? <laughs> because yeah, yeah, some tragic things can happen with something like that. So you do have to, you know, if you see some unsafe things going on in your, um, you know, in your Zoom meetings and stuff, something you should do something for sure. Okay, sorry I hit you over the head with so much health and safety stuff, but that's probably the biggest and most difficult thing to be thinking about. And it actually then feel, feeds right into the next one, which is managing potential lawsuit risks going forward here. Okay, what am I talking about? Well, what I would say is that um, we, we've actually done a little history, we've done a little searching on the web about where is the sort of current state of lawsuits in the country right now around COVID. And you've seen, what well, we have seen are a few legislatures responding, saying that, um, like for example, I think it's in Wyoming, for example, they have a law that says, look, if you're a business that, um, here we go, immunity for COVID-19 related claims to business entities that follow instructions from state, city or town public, public health officers. Okay, um, so California hasn't gone that way yet, but I'm expecting that they will. They actually did pass some legislation related to this in the spec, I'll tell you, but not about um, you know immunity from lawsuits or stuff. So one thing you should know that in a lawsuit, um, well, let me tell you a little bit about how a lawsuit happens here. Okay, any fool can sue you, okay? But the thing you have to worry about is what could they reasonably be successful at suing me about? All right, so what's the standard? The standard is you have, in, in this situation, it's, it's what's called negligence you have to worry about, not using due care to your, in your relationships with other people. So it starts with a duty, okay? The idea, what is your duty to somebody else who you're coming into contact with? And so what you probably got to guess here is those all those health and safety things that I was talking about earlier, that defines your duty to people. <laughs> your employees to your customers, okay? So that should be pretty straightforward. Normally you just have, like, like if you were just out on the street and somebody was coming next to, you know, coming in contact with you on the street, your duty would be very limited because, you know, um, it's pretty, pretty much to sort of not um, do anything that would, you know, injure them or um, put them at risk or something like that. So you know, that, that duty is heightened when they come into your business or you are touching them or doing something that related to your business, of course, going forward. So pay close attention to those health and safety requirements. And as I said, keep records about how you've been paying attention to those health and safety requirements. Okay, so you're doing your part, taking care of your duty and all that. What a lawsuit says is uh, you have breached that duty. You did not follow the health and safety requirements there. And that breach of your duty caused me damages, okay? Um, now you should know there's two parts of causation. One is actual and one is foreseeable. And so how would I explain this? Um, 
if um, it may be that something happened. Oh, here you go. I'll use a, an old example in a, in a lawsuit from way back in the 1900s. So this guy is, uh, you know, a sailor. He's walking on the decks, uh, you know, in the, on the docks, and he's, light, you know, smoking a cigarette, and he throws the cigarette away, and it happens to go into the hole of a ship where there's fertilizer and other very flammable things, and the whole ship blows up, okay? Well, in that situation, um, he would probably be found to have breached his duty not to throw away the, the cigarette, but did he understand that it was going to blow up an entire ship when he did that? Probably not foreseeable in that situation, but, you know, so there would be a judge looking at this and sort of saying, well, should we hold him accountable for that thing that, you know, maybe he didn't foresee was going to happen, but it did actually, he caused it. And then, of course, the damage is you have to figure out how much the damage was there. Okay, um, so why am I telling you this? Okay, um, it's hard to show causation in these kinds of situations. It really is. I mean, the litigation that we've seen mostly are two places, cruise ships, okay, and nursing homes. Both of those, it's relative for, for people who are, you know, have to stay at the nursing home is the thing. And the same thing as the people who have to stay on the cruise ship. So the idea is, yeah, there's a much easier case you could make that they got on the boat, they didn't have the causation, and they didn't have the COVID, and then they got it, you know, probably they got it there. So, so what I'm saying to you is, this is, this is a little different then maybe another kind of lawsuit that you folks are fearing on a regular basis, like an ADA lawsuit. Okay, so this is Americans with Disabilities Act. You don't have a ramp in front of your business that you're supposed to have. You don't have the parking spaces carved out on your parking lot where a van could be, so there's space for the wheelchair van to move. It's easier to show causation there that you violated the ADA because there's very specific guidelines about what employers have to have. And it's obvious whether you have a ramp or whether you have the paint on your, on your parking spaces and stuff. So I wouldn't immediately worry that there's gonna be some serial smart cookie lawyer who's gonna start going around and saying to people, okay, well, you caused my client's COVID, so, you know, you know pay me now or we're gonna hit you with a multi-million dollar lawsuit. There could be people going out like that, but what I would say to you is they're gonna have a hard time proving that. You know, it's gonna, it's, it's something that you should definitely talk with your insurance company about if it happens, but I would say generally you can tell those people to go fly. <laughs> um, so, um, so here's the thing, we haven't heretofore in California yet given anybody immunity yet but that's a place where I think people could be going in the future on that. So until you get to that, insurance is pretty important for you folks. And, and I guess I would say, even if you haven't had a conversation recently with it, go to your insurer and say, look, I'm gonna be opening up, um, risks of COVID are out there, you know, are these things that you will cover? You know, what if somebody does allege this thing? Will you be defending me? Will you, will you respond to that claim? Um, because insurers, you know, do have this option that some are taking that say, oh, COVID, we couldn't have paid attention to COVID. Oh, we had no idea this was coming. So, so the coverage that we wrote you didn't take into account COVID. We can't extend it to you in this situation. That's what's called force majeure, okay, or frustration of purpose or something. So just make sure that your insurer is on the same page with you and stuff. And then there's this thing called waivers, okay? Well, fortunately, let me populate this up here. We actually have a COVID-19 waiver that I put in this Google Drive for you. So if you wanna take this, um, go to this place in the Google Drive. I put our COVID risk liability waiver in there. It's uh, two pages, so it may feel like a little overkill. But um, by the way, you know where we took this from? We actually composed this from President Trump's rallies when they were putting out COVID-19 waivers for people. We also took it from NASCAR because NASCAR was also running during these periods of time. So we put that together, we've whittled it down a little bit. That's 
now you can benefit from it there. Okay, now what are we talking about with using these waivers? The main thing you should know is that the more specific you can be on the waiver about the risk that the person is waiving, it's going to be more effective. So I was just talking with somebody who um, uh, was a cosmetologist. So I said, um, look, um, why not, instead of just giving them this waiver to sign, okay, that's one thing, it, you know, you come into my shop, you, you take the risk of liability here. Okay, well, that'll work. But it'll be even more effective if you say on the waiver, look, um, I'm gonna take all the precautions that I can, you know, nothing is 100% effective. I'm gonna be in close contact with you for the next 45 minutes as I'm working on your you know, hair or your nails or something. I'll be masked, but it does mean that you will be exposed to me and I'll be exposed to you much more closely than if you, you know, were just um, you know, outside my store. So um, try and be specific in the, when you use a waiver more about the risk involved, that'll make it much more effective. And of course you can use it with consumers, you can't use it with employees generally because they don't have any bargaining power on it. Okay, but I think your best risk right now, your best guard against risk right now is definitely doing those health and safety requirements and making sure your insurer is on board, okay? All right, well, that's managing your lawsuit risk. Last thing I wanted to cover here is contractors, okay? Using care when you're using contractors. Why am I doing this? Well, AB5, you probably heard about this thing. It came in uh, at the start of the pandemic uh, last year, about a year now. Um, it became effective that basically set forth these new rules for all businesses when they hire self-employed contractors, okay? So it was called the ABC test. I'll tell you what that is in a second. It makes it much harder for a business to hire independent contractors due, the, due to a risk of potential misclassification, okay? Um, and so the risk is that under this law, people can go back four years. Oops, sorry, don't know why I'm I have auto, auto fill there, sorry. Um, people can go back four years to say, I was misclassified, you should have been paying me as an employee. Now you have to pay past wages and also my social security taxes for this period of time. Okay, that's a pretty big risk. <laughs> it's a pretty big risk for people who are um, uh, um, wanting to contract with you, okay? So, but fortunately, the ABC test does, the AB5 law does give you a sense of what you need to do if you are a contractor to be able to satisfy um, this list of this ABC test. We're going to go over that in just a second here. So there's implications for both those who are working as a contractor for you to continue to be able to get contracted work and for those who employ contractors. So let's start first with those who work as contractors. Okay, what you need to do is to create this presumption that you are an independent business, okay? And what that means is basically three things, okay? And as I said, these are, these are not re total requirements. You could still be a sole proprietor potentially and do your job and be contracted with, but there are gonna be people out there who say, no, 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 I am only from here on out gonna be contracting with a legal entity like an LLC or a corporation. Because once you do that, your risk of misclassification is like totally up out the window, okay? Because you're an entity, you're not a single person anymore, okay? All right, so that's one thing. And by the way, we can help you with that. We can do an LLC for you. We can do a single member LLC for you if you're a sole proprietor. Very easy to do, not very expensive. Um, it does require an annual franchise tax that you have to pay California of $800. But, you know, to be able to do contracted work, oh, by the way, that limited liability um, shield that you get for that $800 a year also protects you against lawsuits. Ah, okay. So, so just want to say that forming a separate legal entity is more and more a really good idea these days for sole proprietors. And by the way, for um, folks who are, um, don't have right to work, it gives you the ability to earn profits from a business in a way that doesn't, it doesn't matter that you don't have the right to work. Um, anybody can earn profits from a business. So another good reason to do that legal entity. So then the other aspect of this, when I say independent business, I mean, set it up so that 
it's clear that you are available and hopefully working for other people because as you're doing that, then you fall into this ABC exception. I'll show you this in a second. That gives you a, them a sense uh, that you are in business for yourself and you work for others. That's prong C of the ABC test. So let's go now to the people who are employing contractors, how you need to be more careful in classifying your workers. That's true. So the ABC test basically adds on two portions, two new things to this what used to be the A part, which is the only part that used to be there, technically, or I should say practically speaking, that used to be that you just had a sense of, well, independent contracts, you can't, you can't control them very much. So for example, you can't have your CEO be a contractor because you got to control that person generally, right? Um, you can't have them come in and sit at the desk for eight hours a day uh, and wear your uniform and get training from you. That's too much control, that's too much control. Independent contractors should generally be able to control the means and manner to which uh, they're gonna do their job. Um, they do have a deadline maybe from you. You know, the project um, has to be done by this date or this website has to have these features uh, going forward. Um, yeah, you can put those kinds of controls in, but, um, you know, generally they need to do it on their own time with their own tools and stuff. So that's the first prong. Second prong, um, and this is the one that Uber and Lyft got in so much trouble over. Um, you can't use contractors to provide people who, you know, services that normally employees would be, would be doing. So you're doing a daycare business. Your teachers should be teach employees, not contractors. Um, so that's another part of the category, there's a presumption that everybody's an employee unless you meet this test here. And then that last prong there, independent contractors need to be in business for themselves, able to work for others. That's another way Uber got into trouble uh, was that you know these drivers weren't driving for anybody else. Um, so in many ways, they were just benefiting from paying them less. You know? um, so there's over a hundred exceptions. <laughs> to the AB5 requirements. If you just jump to this NOLO press um, overview right there, you can see which ones are, are there. If you find an exception, just remember that you still can't control that contractor very much, but do check with us if you have some questions about how to do this. All contractor relationships have to be in writing. So just make sure you get that in writing going forward. All right, guys, well, I think I've gotten through the checklist. Hopefully that didn't take too long. Uh, remember, up your health and safety game and keep good records of how you're doing it. Um, manage those lawsuit risks by complying with your duties to follow the health and safety requirements in the, in the area there. Check with your insurer to make sure you're covered on things. And finally, if you're using contractors or you are a contractor, take into account that the laws have changed a bit there. Uh, if you are a contractor, consider forming an entity, consider building a record that you're working for others. And then if you're hiring contractors, make sure you put it in writing and you satisfy this ABC test that we're talking about. Here's a few other resources on the health and safety side. I mean, definitely check your health departments, your county health departments uh, about their guidelines going forward. The CDC has some really good guides for businesses and stuff. Um, those are the main things I was gonna cover with you guys. So uh, here's our, you know, we'll go over some questions now, but here's our contact information there. So we're talking about um, to get service from us, sign up for office hours. Uh, oops, go back. Um, go to this website, www.law.berkeley.edu uh, backslash NBCLC. <clears throat> um, and uh, we do have a Facebook page and Instagram page. Uh, but yeah, contact us if you need some assistance. We'll do our very best to help. Okay, well, let's stop with the share and let's maybe go to some uh, questions. Hi, Bill. Go. Hi, Bill. So we have only one question in the chat box and we are like two minutes until two. So we'll oh, wrap it up sorry. quickly here. Um, no, no worries. Uh, so really quickly, just the question here, it's what are the legal ramifications of requiring employees to be vaccinated? Ooh, really good question there, guys. Um, as I understand it, you cannot ask somebody to, there's there's an ADA issue around that, that you can't require people to, even hospitals can't require people to be, to be vaccinated. Now, you can have ramifications if you don't vaccinate. Uh, so for example, a hospital, if a doctor didn't want to 
vaccinate uh, be vaccinated, then they could assign them to like maybe lower risk units, like uh, not oncology, not surgery, you know, something like that. Um, so there is a way that yes, you you can take into account that somebody is not vaccinated in the way that they create race risk for your organization. You can't fire them. Um, that's the, that's basically the the story on that. And just know that there are some things. You know, some people are worried about side effects, uh, and so that means that they have potentially an ADA issue if you, you know. If, they, if you ding them for that, uh, there's accommodations. You got to think about reasonable accommodations for people who have that, you know, like a vaccine phobia of some sort. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that's the only question on here. And I did go went ahead and share the Eventbrite link to sign up for legal office hours. And of yes. course, everyone the RSVP today will be receiving the recording of the of today's presentation. And also, it is on on Facebook Live, so you can visit our. Our, our website there to uh, take a look and view. <laughs> okay, well, wonderful. Um, yeah, and go and uh, check out the uh, resources on that one page too. That on the on the PowerPoint at the end, if, if there's some other good health and safety. Absolutely. So well, I so it is now two o'clock. We're gonna end the meeting, uh, but thank you everyone for joining us. And we will, if you didn't sign up, feel free to give us uh, send me an email, and we'll make sure to send you the recording over. So we will see you for our next meeting. Uh, as mentioned, you know, let us know the topics that you are interested in learning more about here as we continue um or continue to operate so april 16 the next webinar so thank you everyone have a good rest of your day and thank you bill and liana thank you so much for the resources provided today hey thanks sandra thank, thank you, you. Thanks, liana. have a good weekend bye-bye